Hey guys, the fire but is here. My brother couldn't be here today because he's being forced to watch Transformers Energon for escaping the basement. That's the joke. Anyways, so um about half a year by the point I'm recording this, um, I made a video talking about all Transformers from the movie universe and what happened to them. Now, I actually do intend to cover every single Transformers from the movies, the toy line, the comics, the games, and I vastly underestimated how hard covering just the first movie cast was going to be. So the first video, which was half an hour long, was just me covering the Olobot cast from 2007. Now in this video, I'll cover the Decepticon version since a lot of you guys have been begging me to do so. If you guys haven't checked out Power 1, I'm gonna put a link to it in the description down below and I'm gonna have that as a pinned comment in the comments down below. Anyways, so a lot of you guys have been requesting me to continue this and yeah, I mean, I kinda procrastinated on it because at the beginning that video didn't do so well but over time it has grown for whatever reason. <laughs> it YouTube works in mysterious ways. And at the same time, um... The first part was so long and so traumatic for me, I was like, I need a long break before I make part 2. So, you know, you guys better like, comment, and subscribe. Let's get this video to 1k likes, and I'll work on part 3 right away where I cover a bunch of the Fallen. You guys will see some familiar faces here, some characters you never heard of, and probably learn a thing or two about what happened to them. But watch like the previous video, I'll talk about the characters, what they did, where they come from, and if they're alive or not. So without further ado, let's... Begin. So our first Decepticon is named Agoraptor. Yeah, it's kind of a weird name, but the thing is that much like Ago Racer, which I cover in the all of us section of things, this was a character that was designed for the game All Spark Wars. The reason why it looks like a kid doodled it is because a kid actually doodled it. I mean, not that respect to whoever won if you're watching this. I mean, I think that's really cool that you won. He goes from an alternate timeline where the Autobots basically lost, and it's up to Agor Racer, our hot rod of the team, to use the Allspark shards to revive Optimus, Prime, Bumblebee, and the other Autobots to fight back against the Decepticons. By the end of the game, the Decepticons are forced to leave the planet, and Agor Raptor promises that he will return someday. And we never see him again! Next up we got Barricade, and this guy doesn't need an introduction. We all know who Barricade is, He's the coolest bad cop around before he was cool. And um, yeah, he appeared in 2007, got into a skirmish with Bumblebee, got beat up, didn't do anything for the rest of the movie, reappeared on Dark of the Moon for whatever reason, got his eyes shot off, played dead, was seen briefly in Age of Extinction, came back for TLK, and went missing once again. Very Kid is a very strange character because of his weird tendency to disappear. It's basically a running gag at this point. But for some reason he's one of those characters, those movie characters that people just generally like, even though he didn't really do much throughout the movies. Next up we got Blackout, the first Decepticon we see on screen, and he has one of the most iconic scenes in all the franchise where he raids the human military base in the Middle East. Unfortunately for Blackout, after that he didn't do much throughout the movie and when we do see him in the Battle of Mission City, he has a short fight with Ironhide and then gets killed by being shot in the crotch. That was a terrible way to go. Hopefully Rise of Unicron does this guy some justice. Next up is Bone Crusher, another G1 character that was very underutilized in the movie. I thought he had a pretty cool robot and vehicle mode in the movie. He got into a small fight with Optimus Prime and got decapitated. He'll be the first of many head related kills that Optimus will get throughout the movies. Next up we got Booster X-10. He's part of the Real Gear Robots toy line, which is basically, you know, appliances that transform into the Decepticon and Autobot spies. He has a rivalry with Autobot Speed Dial 800, but since they're both very tiny robots and they're, you know, just meant to spy on people, I doubt that rivalry will go anywhere. Next up we got Bro, another fan favorite-ish type of character that appeared in 2007. He has a pretty cool vehicle mode and a really sweet robot mode, who was very underutilized in the movie. He was the Autobots and the humans like main um, source of headaches during the Battle of Mission City and got killed by Bumblebee after having his spark exposed during the earlier battle, causing him to die. Funnily enough, a lot of time material really hypes up Brawl. Some time material eating claims that Brawl can take down a skyscraper with his muscles alone, which Instead of making this guy cooler, it just makes it even sadder that we're never gonna see him do something like that in the movie. Next up we got the class Alpha Drone Units. 
Now these are not exactly seekers, these are um, like the name suggests, drones that are under the command of Dreadwing and look exactly just like him. Now these guys used to be Autobots, but when the war started a lot of them fell under the control of Megatron, so every time we see them it's strictly under the Decepticon side. We see these guys very often throughout the comics used as cannon fodder, and honestly these guys should have been the Protoform army in the movies, instead of having boring old grey looking protoforms, these guys look at least somewhat cool and pleasing to look at. Another wasted opportunity if you ask me. Next up we got the class beta drones. Their backstory is pretty much the same as the class alpha droids, but ironically enough, despite being labeled beta, these guys are actually stronger than the alpha drones. They're stronger, more durable, the only hindrance that these guys have is that they can't fly. The Decepticons will often use them as cannon fathers to fight against the Autobots and keep them busy. This guy should have been the Decepticon cannon father of the movies, not the protoforms. Next up we got Crankcase. Yeah, it's not the one from Dark of the Moon, 2007 had a different Crankcase. Now this Crankcase is basically just a Decepticon foot soldier, who stayed behind on Cyber while many of the other Decepticon leaders went to Earth to reclaim the Allspark. When Starscream came back, he ran some errands for Starscream. Moving equipment around, capturing Autobots. Since this was a thankless job, he kinda complained to his leader that he wasn't getting enough credit around there. Something that Starscream didn't took so well and basically pulled the bone by having Crankcase's vocal processor irreparably damaged, basically rendering him mute. And then using Crankcase as a sacrifice to power an old Spark Cube replica, which they then ended up working and Crankcase basically died for nothing. Poor guy, he just wanted some acknowledgement. Next up is Creatorbot. Now this guy needs his own video because he's very interesting, but he's basically the protagonist of the Transformers 2007 um, Nintendo DS version of the game. The story of that game is actually pretty good and I can't do it justice in this small summary, but what, I, what I'm gonna say is that he arrives on Earth, he's basically Starscream's protege, and he's caught up between his loyalty to Starscream and his loyalty to his Decepticon comrades who want to revive Megatron and Starscream doesn't wanna do that. It's actually a very cool story that deserves its own video. Ultimately by the end of the game, Creatorbot learns the hard way of what it really means to be a Decepticon and ends up getting killed by Megatron after being severely damaged fighting the traitor Starscream, keeping true to the Decepticon mantra that the strong survive and the weak perish, leaving Megatron as the last Decepticon standing and Creatorbot as the last Earth Decepticon to fall. In the Autobot campaign, he gets killed off pretty early on by the Creatorbot of the Autobot version of the game, so he dies either way, unfortunately. Next up we got Dispenser, who in all honesty shouldn't count as a Decepticon, but the way he lists him as a Decepticon, so so will I. He's one of the many Allspark creations that come to life after Sam keeps on constantly bumping the Allspark everywhere. He gets killed off by Ratchet when the ladder steps on him, after the Autobots and humans are cleaning up the city of any remaining Allspark mutations. Next up we got Dive Bomb. After the Battle of Mission City and when Starscream returned to Cybertron, some Decepticons led by Dreadwing basically rebelled against Starscream's reign. Dive Bomb joined Dreadwing's side and fought against Starscream's Decepticons and the Autobots who had joined the mix halfway throughout the battle. He was severely injured during the battle and it really seemed like he died when he got thrown into the canopy of Dreadwing's ship and exploded. But surprisingly enough, he survived this and made his way to Earth, where he joined other Decepticons who were selling weapons to humans. Unfortunately, the deal went sideways and the Autobots and Nash showed up. Dybum had the smartest idea any Decepticon has had in the movies, and that's honestly not a high bar to cross. He took the humans hostage and told the Autobots to back away or he's gonna fry them. But unfortunately, Ironhide snuck up behind the group and shot him in the back, finally ending the Decepticon's life. Next up is Dreadwing. Dreadwing was the source in which the class Alpha drone units originated from. As such, he's in command of all those drones and functioned as a leader of the Defense Force on Cybertron. Eventually, when Starscream showed up, he wasn't very happy with that and planned a coup de tag against the newly arrived Starscream. Long story short, things went sideways, the Autobots joined, Dreadwing tried to run away, he made it all the way to Mars but was followed by Starscream. When Dreadwing thought he was safe and far away from the madness of Cybertron, Starscream ripped out his spark and crushed it. His corpse was later found by Soundwave, who was analyzing the aftermath of the events that transcurred on Mars. Next up we got Dropkick. 
this is not this is not the bone movie drop kick this is 2007 drop kick and he was basically just a generic decepticon who arrived on earth by soundwave's orders to look for the star harvester at some point he came into conflict with ness and the Olobots. he was defeated by optimus prime and then finished off by ness soldiers hey at least things got better for him in the bv movie kind of Next up we got Fracture, who's a character that appears in the Transformers comics and also answers Soundwave's call of heading to Earth to find the Star Harvester. After scanning a new vehicle mode and raiding a couple of human military bases, she comes into conflict with Ness and she gets ran over the road by Ironhide and dies from the fall. First female Decepticon we see and she's gone. Next up we got Frenzy. He was the Decepticon's head spy in 2007, who infiltrated a bunch of government systems and hacked a bunch of their uh, hardware. He died when he tried to prevent the humans from calling an airstrike in Mission City. During his failed attempt to save his comrades, Francis sends a bunch of flying discs that ricochet all over the room to bisect the humans, but ultimately ends up bisecting himself and cutting his head off, permanently this time. His head will later be seen in Revenge of the Fallen where it's kept by Simmons as some kind of souvenir. Next up we got Glacier, Shock, Plasma, and Vortex Drones. They all share the same fate and they're basically almost exactly the same except for the kind of equipment they use, so I might as well put them all together. They appear in the hit game Transformers Rise of the Chevy Autobots, and yes, that's an actual thing. They were the underlings of the Decepticon mainframe, and their task was to stop Bumblebee and the Chevy Autobots from rising. Title drop. They're only seen in this game and they never appear anywhere else ever again, so we can all assume that all of these models got destroyed. Next up we got Gun Barrel, the Decepticon who's said to have enough firepower to rival Brawl, and also has a pretty good looking vehicle mode, I'm not gonna lie. He's one of the many Decepticons that get sent to Earth by Soundwave to basically act as cannon father and get killed by the Autobots and their human allies. So yeah, another waste of character. But it won't be the last of Soundwave suicide cons. Next up, we got Hardtop, who's a Decepticon sniper that got left behind on Mars while his superiors went to Earth to try and retreat the Allspark. When Starscream came back alone, the Autobots launched a full scale military assault on their base on Mars. Hardtop volunteered to counter the Autobots, and as soon as he was about to kill Autobot Smokescreen, he was outsniped by RC herself killing him instantly. Next up we got Incinerator, a Decepticon with a very cool sounding name and is one of the stronger Decepticons of 2007 according to the toy specs, who was part of Soundwave's Suicide Con initiative and you can see where this is going. He lands on Earth and actually puts up a decent fight against the Autobots and the Nest Soldiers. He was about to kill Ratchet until Ratchet cut off part of his leg, causing him to lose his balance, giving Optimus Prime the chance to actually end the Decepticon by stabbing him in the back with his Energon Blades. You know, for someone who speaks of honor, Optimus Prime has a weird habit of, you know, killing people from the back. Next up we got Jetstone. No, not the Beast Machine's Jetstone, unfortunately. This is a different Jetstorm, who appears in the comics and was sent by Soundwave Suicide Cons to try and distract the Autobots from them finding the Star Harvester. You can see where this is going, he fights against the humans, he kills a whole bunch of them actually, and um, ends up ultimately getting killed by Optimus Prime. You know, the joke of the Autobot side of things was that Optimus Prime sent a bunch of creepy Autobots to spy on Sam's high school. Well, the joke of the Decepticon side of things is that Soundwave sends his suicide cons to die pointlessly on Earth. These guys were the suicide cons before it was cool. Next up we got Jolt. No, it's not the Autobot one. The Decepticons also had a Jolt of their own, who much like the Autobot Jolt, they didn't really do much. He was part of the suicide cons and you can see where this is going. He was on a mission alongside some of his Decepticon bodies exploring San Francisco, just enjoying the sights, not doing anything evil, looking for the Star Harvester. When all of a sudden, the Autobots show up with no warning, they don't even tell them to surrender. The first thing that Optimus does when he has them on side, he rams Jolt over in vehicle mode, killing him instantly. I think the Autobots have a ramming fetish in this series, because a lot of the kills we got in so far have been vehicle based. But holy crap, Prime, that is brutal! At least tell him to surrender first. Next up we got Mailstorm, who is a near perfect replica of the Decepticon mainframe, and he's in command of the Glacier Alpha Plasma drones that I covered a while back. He appears on the game Transformers Rust the Chevy Autobots. And the Autobots, along with the Chevy Autobots, launch a full-scale assault at his base, and he is tasked to defend it. 
Obviously things do not go well and the Autobots manage to take down Maelstrom, whose spark was connected to his boss mainframe, so by killing him they made mainframe weaker. And speaking of which, next up we got mainframe, who's an ancient Decepticon who was exiled from the Decepticons because he challenged Megatron for leadership, he had the balls to do what Starscream couldn't do. He lost and he was forced to leave Cybertron. He built his own Decepticon mini army and created his general Maelstrom to help command his legions. He appears in the game Transformers Rise of Chevy Autobots which takes place before 2007. He arrived on Earth a little earlier than that and started killing Autobots every here and there and capturing some of them, which obviously made the Autobots notice. And Bumblebee led a strike team of Autobots to attack his main base and finally put an end to his general, Maelstrom and himself. After his death, his base was completely destroyed and the Autobots that he had captured were rescued by Bumblebee and Optimus Prime. Hey, you know, props for doing what Starscream could never really do in the movies. Next up, we got Meantime. Now, don't let that name fool you. This guy is one of the most dangerous, potentially universe-draining Decepticons I ever seen. And no, 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 I, I am not making a joke or anything. I'm being for real, um, Meantime, like his name suggests, has the power to stop time and wind time back. Just like Hot Rod, but cooler. And um, I, he got this power because he's a creation of the Allspark, and the Allspark just felt like giving this random watch time powers, cuz... Hello, 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 I guess. Vector Prime even acknowledged that Meantime could be a really dangerous threat to himself and the timeline if he really wanted to. The reason why Meantime doesn't do anything and it's never mentioned is because Meantime's kind of stupid. All he does is pull dumb YouTube pranks on little kids to mess with them. I, I am not kidding, that's what this guy's all about. He's like if the twins had omniversal, you know, omnipotent power and they just wanted to go around, you know, just like fooling around and not doing anything productive. That's basically what Meantime is. Next up we got Megatron and this guy doesn't need an introduction. He arrived on Earth chasing the Allspark where, you know, he was rescued by his underlings and tried to get the Allspark only to die trying and having the Allspark destroyed. He was revived in Revenge of the Fallen to look for the Star Harvester and the Matrix to use it to harvest Earth's sun. He was stopped and the Star Harvester was destroyed. Then in Dark of the Moon, he used the pillars to transport Cybertron and transferred Earth's resources to Cybertron in order to rebuild it. Which failed because the pillars were destroyed for the most part. And ended up getting his spine ripped off. Then in Age of Extinction, he came back as Gavatron through some Insecticon shenanigans. Where he tried to get the seed to build a new army to destroy the Earth, where he was stopped by the Autobots once again. Then he met with Quintessa, got a new body. Then he was looking for the talisman and the staff to transfer Earth's energy to Cybertron in order to rebuild it again. And he was stopped by the Autobots once again. Mate, do you know the definition of insanity? You can boil down Megatron's whole story to, So I came from this place and was looking for that object only to have that object destroyed. And then I came back in a sick new body just to do the same thing over and over and over and over again. Uh, I miss 2007 where Megatron was, you know, very dangerous and arguably a bunch of the fallen because after those two movies Megatron became a joke. Even though I still think that the last night Megatron is his best incarnation, at least the best he's ever looked. Next up we got Midnighter XR4. He's one of the real gear robots who spies on humans. And his whole thing is that he's obsessed with punctuality by never punctual himself. <laughs> that's the joke, that's the description. Now Hasbro wants you to get them all your money. Now this one doesn't really count as a transformer, but it's a running gag, running joke, and that's Mustache Man. I think Trans Theory did a video dissecting this guy and his lore. So if you guys want to learn more about him, go check that video out. He's basically the hologram that all the Decepticons use to hide amongst the human populace, in military bases, in cities, or wherever other places. He appears in 2007 and makes a small cameo in Revenge of the Fallen. And his last known appearance was in the Cyber Missions little series and he's never seen again after that. Which is kind of a shame, because having a hologram kinda helps with the whole, you know, robots in disguise thing. Next up we got Mudflap. So, in an alternate universe, more precisely the Titan movie comics, he was one of Starscream's many generals, who participated in the retaking of America. But he then defected to Starcade's new Decepticons really quickly, 
As far as we know, this guy's still alive. Next up we got Overcast, who again according to the toy specs and a video that I did a long long time ago, is actually one of the strongest 2007 Decepticons. But unfortunately he had the very bad luck of being part of Soundwave's Suicide Cons initiative, of sending Decepticons to her to look for the Allspark and just having them get killed off by Ness. Overcast laid havoc to a Japan Air Self Defense Force base before leveling the whole installation blackout style. However, his victory was short lived when the Autobots and Nest shot him out of the sky in Europe, killing him. Next up, we got Payload, who was one of the many Decepticons that got left behind on Cybertron, and when Starscream came back, he began to serve under him. However, when Dreadwing rebelled against Starscream, Payload, however, sided with Starscream as his loyalists to defend against the renegade Decepticons. But when Arcee's Autobots joined the mix, the battle became too chaotic. Payload grappled with Starcade, but he eventually got the better of him. Outmatched, Payload did the smartest thing that Transformers could ever do when they get into a fight. Run away. He started fleeing from his life as Starcade was chasing him, and he's never seen again. Which, props to him, that was actually smart, because he actually did manage to survive all the way to Revenge of the Fallen. With where he scanned a vehicle mode that made him look like long haul. According to the toy bios, he got into a fight with Ratchet and Jolt and ended up getting killed by the two. So, I mean, at least he survived for a decent amount of time, so I'll give him some credit. Once again, we have another real gear robot, Photon T34. He has a rivalry with Twitcher F451 and likes to mess with human infrastructure. All that we know about him is that the Decepticons kind of avoid him because he has a very toxic personality. You know, considering how the Decepticons are, where, you know, they kill each other, they steal from each other, uh, they're not very nice to one another, I wonder how bad Fallen T-34's personality is to the point that those same Decepticons don't want to hang out with him. It, may, it really makes you wonder. Next up we got Power Up BT-6, who transforms into a handheld gaming system. Power Up and Suma 25X have teamed up to form the self-designated Brain Scrambler Team, which honestly sounds much cooler than what they actually do. Their mission is to screw with human children just for the lols. I am not kidding when I say this stuff by the way. Zoom Out does the evil act of manufacturing embarrassing incriminating videos for the parents to find while Power Up scrambles the poor kid's brains so they can't defend themselves. This obviously accomplishes nothing for the Decepticon cause, but these two just like messing around with human children for some reason. I almost feel like all of the real gear robots are just a, j a big joke that Hasbro's having. I mean, some of these are cool, but a lot of these guys as characters, they're pretty pointless and boring, and lame, and stupid, and lame. Next up we got Rever. He was part of those Soundwave suicide cons, and basically that's all you need to know at this point. Y you, you can figure out the rest. Next up we got Scorponok, a character that most people seem to always forget about, like they always forget that Scorponok is part of 2007. He was, you know, Blackout's partner, and was sent down to hunt down the remaining human soldiers that managed to flee Blackout's rampage. During the battle, he lost his tail, and that was later used by the human by the human military to figure out how could they possibly combat the Decepticons. He's never seen for the rest of the movie, and makes a short reappearance in Revenge of the Fallen, where he's, he's part of the Egypt Decepticons that were trying to recover the Matrix of leadership so they can use it to activate the Star Harvester. He was promptly killed by Jetfire after critically injuring him. Poor guy got his moment to shine and then got his head crushed. Next up we got Scrapper, he's one of the many Decepticon drones who appears in the Transformers The Game for consoles and Revenge of the Fallen PSP edition. There are many like him and they're never seen again after Revenge of the Fallen so we can assume they're all dead. Next up we got Shockwave, yeah I, um there's two, there's like three different Shockwaves in the movie continuities. There's like the one from 2007 The Game where he's a triple changer and looks very cool actually who promptly appears after Bumblebee gets captured to combat the Autobots. He caused some massive damage towards the city but was eventually stopped by Optimus Prime. And in Transformers the Game PSP edition, he's commanding the Decepticons into search for the Allspark and Megatron on Earth. After fighting the Autobots all across the globe and eventually reviving Megatron, the events of 2007 basically play out with Megatron dying and the Allspark being destroyed. 
Shogreave retreats back to Cybertron along with Starscream. Back on their homeworld, Shogreave and Starscream face off for leadership of the Decepticons, with Starscream ultimately claiming victory, which, that's the most unbelievable part of this game, Starscream being able to beat Shockwave. Like, we all know if the two were to fight, that will not be the case. But yeah, Shockwave does in both versions. Sucks to be him, I guess. Next up we got Starscream, who is Megatron's second in command, and honestly, never really betrays Megatron into movies at least. He does in the comics and I made a whole video talking about the many times he did in other media, but but if you just watch the movies or just consider the movies to be canon, Starscream may seem like just an order Decepticon that's somewhat loyal to Megatron. He still does have his like little um, treacherous tendencies, but not as much as it really should. And ultimately ends up getting killed by Sam with Wiki in a very, 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 very stupid way. Like, Starscream, like, really, man? Like, really, man? I know it hurts. Like, really, man? I know it hurts. But stop moving, grab the cable, squash Sam with Wiki, and then rip it off. I'm sure there are many doctors out there who can get you a new eye. We can fix Bumblebee's legs. I'm sure we can get you a new eye. Next up, we got Stockade. Now, Stockade is actually one of the strongest Decepticons around. He actually fought Ironhide one time and destroyed him. At least in the Titan movie comics. Like, Stockade is one of the most durable and physically strong characters out there. He was left behind on Cybertron and served Starscream after he came back from the Battle of Mission City. When the Autobots attacked and Dreadwing led a rebellion against Starscream, Stockade sided with Starscream and fought scorches of drones and even payload at one point. He was basically a one-man army and after Triticon City was destroyed by Dreadwing and Starscream's reckless use of a space bridge, um, yeah, uh, long story. Just go with it, these are the comics. Stockade is never seen again, so we don't know if he's alive or not, but I like to think he got away. This guy is too cool to kill. Please do your series make a Stockade toy. Storm Surge was one of the Decepticons' earliest members. At some point, he made it all the way to Earth. At some point, Starscream got tired of listening to Megatron and being abused by him. So after a bunch of the falling, he basically broke off from Megatron and formed his own little Decepticon empire. And by empire, I just mean like, 12 to 20 people, not a lot. Eventually, Starscream gets tracked down by Shockwave and is forced to rejoin Megatron's Decepticons, which he does reluctantly and sends his Decepticon army to create a distraction for the Autobots by hunting down Sam with Wiki. Him and the other Decepticons pretty much trash the city, but are slowed down by the efforts of Wheeljack and Mirage, who join the battle to stop them. Mirage gets into a fight with Bludgeon, and turns invisible to get the drop on Bludgeon. Bludgeon turns around thinking that he can hear Mirage's footsteps and shoots Storm Surge instead. Possibly killing him? I don't know, it's, it's not made very clear. But Bludgeon doesn't seem to care too much either way. Next up we got Swindle. Swindle was one of the many, and I mean many, Decepticon drones of the same name that were used by the Decepticons throughout the war. And the main Swindle, however, was part of Soundwave's suicide cons that were sent to Earth with the mission to find the Star Harvester. He was actually encountered in the Autobots and Ness' first mission as a, as a team, where he gets into a small fight with his old arch nemesis, Bumblebee. After being distracted by Captain Lennox, he's shot in the back by Bumblebee. And before dying, he tells the Autobots, The Fallen will rise- Oh, I'm sorry, I mean, he says, The Decepticons will find it. Which, nice going, Swindle, you just told the enemy that you guys are looking for something. How about keeping that information classified next time? Oh, wait. Next up, we got Twitcher F451, which no, it's not the name of a crappy Twitch knockoff. He's one of the real gear robots who transforms into supposedly an Xbox 360 controller. And he's a bit of a scientist himself, too. Apparently, he has the uncanny ability to formulate a target's complete physiological profile, including all their weaknesses, hangups, and frailty. So he's basically like Scapple and the Doctor drones, but you know, um, not exactly a medic. And that's kind of all we know about him. Next up we got Vortex. Yes, Vortex does appear in the movie continuity. And boy, if you thought Onslaught was done dirty, just wait until you hear Vortex's backstory. During Dreadwing's Rebellion, 
the Ospark replica that Starscream created exploded after being shot down by RC. While everyone was recovering from the explosion, Vortex got up and pointed at where the sniper shot came from, just in time to get shot through the chest himself, killing him. And yeah, that's how he dies. Though technically there's a Dark of the Moon baby on him, which kind of implies that there's another Vortex out there. But we'll get to that when we get there, for now I'm just counting the 2007 one. But this is sketchy canonical ground at best. So I'll just list him as the C's. Sorry Vortex fans. Man, the Combaticons are having it rough. Swendo gets killed from being shot in the back, Onslaught gets double teamed, and Vortex can't finish the sentence. Next up we got Wiretap, B20, who is a jerk, pure and simple. He's an expert hacker who could be moving billions of dollars in currency around the market, hacking nuclear command satellites and causing panic and misinformation on a planetary scale. Instead, he uses his powers to make it look like you, you send embarrassing emails and then puts unsavory links in your browser history at work. The worst part is that these are cool ideas for like spy transformers that could probably legitimately break down the world and bring panic of technology to the human populace. But instead these guys are just used as a joke and I think that's the part that hurts me the most. Next up we got Suma25X, who much like I mentioned before, him and Powera BT6 are part of the brain scrambler team that likes messing with little kids. Apparently he also has a crush slash stalkery obsession with, with all about Override from Transformer Cybertron. Ugh. And last but not least, Wreckage. Okay, now this guy in comparison to all the characters I mentioned which either die in the movies, are part of Soundwave Suicide Con team, or are just idiots who um who don't do anything for the Decepticon cost, Wreckage is actually a bit more interesting. He actually was part of a team alongside Brawl, Blackout, Bone Crusher, Scorponok, and Starscream. He landed in Afghanistan alongside the other Decepticon, where he scanned and destroyed a human military carrier that was sent to investigate their planet fall. After scanning the vehicle, he tracked where the humans had come from, and they got into a fight with the US military. During the fight, the Decepticons were wrecking the humans, where all of a sudden Wreckage was hit with a localized electromagnetic pulse and was disabled. After finishing off the rest of the humans, Barricade was treating to his friend's wounds, but Starscream ordered Barricade to leave him, because he claimed that Wreckage would recover eventually, and even if he doesn't, it doesn't really matter to him. So Barricade reluctantly leaves Wreckage behind. This will come back to bite Starscream later, in which we later find out that his body was found by the humans and was placed into stasis by them, much like Megatron. But after the events of 2007, the last Allspark shard was entrusted to the humans for safekeeping. Unfortunately, the shard was placed near Wreckage and the shard flew towards him, bringing him back online. Wreckage then proceeded to lay havoc all across the Sector 7 base, where he fought and brought down all the Transformers that were recently created by the old spot. All of a sudden he was confronted by Starscream who accused Wreckage of treason. This is because Wreckage apparently had made deals with the humans shortly after being captured, allowing the humans to learn more about the Decepticons and how to damage them. So Starscream was pretty pissed and tried to kill Wreckage, but Wreckage was also pretty pissed at Starscream for leaving him behind. Wreckage actually managed to get the upper hand on Starscream and just as he was about to kill him, Momobi showed up and shot off Wreckage's hand, while Starscream took the opportunity and trusted his claws onto Wreckage's spark core, killing him. Which, yeah, I mean, he ended up dying at the end. Hey, but at least he had a cool design and almost got his revenge. That's more than you can say for all of the suicide cons. But yeah, guys, we're now officially done with 2007. For part 3, I'll be covering the Revenge of the Fallen Autobots, and that's gonna be a very, very, very long video. I can, I can just smell <laughs> I can just see it. Um, these videos take a long time to make as there's so much information and so many characters and so much editing and research and stuff like that. It's insane. So if you guys want part 3 to come out really soon, then you know, like, comment, and subscribe. Let me, let me know that you guys are interested in seeing more. And go check out part 1 where I cover all of the 2007 Autobots. But yeah guys, that's it for this video. Hopefully this pleases all of the people who constantly, constantly, and I mean constantly ask me, Fire, when are you gonna do all of the Decepticons for 2007? Well here it is, you can stop asking now, and now you can move on to asking me, Fire, when are you gonna make that video talking about all the Autobots from Revenge of the Fallen? So I can't wait to see like 50 of those comments in like the next couple of videos I upload. 
But yeah, guys, that's it for this video. Hopefully you all enjoy. Let me know which one of these characters was your favorite, which one would you have liked to see in the movie, and which ones you didn't know about. Because there's a lot of people that don't keep up with the comics or the toy line or, you know, other time material. So a lot of these characters are relatively unknown for a lot of people. But, but I still think a lot of them are pretty cool. Though severely and very criminally underutilized though. But this video has gone on for long enough, so I'm gonna end it right here. As always, like, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you guys in the next video. Stay safe guys. Anyways, before we go guys, shout out to our amazing patrons, Xavier the God, Stitch Productions, Scrub Lordo, All Spark Studio, Epic Nin, Laurel Racer, Transformers Gears and Brawn, Optimation Reviews, and a bigger shout out to our two big bold patrons, Jordan the Great and X 23 who donated a amount of money. If you guys want to shout out your subs, all you need to do is donate to my Patreon. The link to it will be in the description down below and in the comments down below. If you choose to donate to my Patreon, you can collab with me in some of my videos or your videos. You can request some artwork from me, request some video topics, get exclusive access to early videos, and a bunch of other stuff. But keep in mind that it is entirely optional since freedom is the right of all sentient beings. Thank you to my Patrons for donating. It's much appreciated. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye guys.